All right, everyone. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the Gospel of John. We're going to be starting a series called The Irresistible Life of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. And we're going to be there for a while. Um, no apologies. Uh, not, not that one. So just you, I, I didn't put the actual slide, so you can just put Jesus is irresistible. But um, we're going to be there for a while, and I hope that you have read John before. I know that when many people come to Christ, they ask, well, where should I start reading? And, and for many, it's the Gospel of John. And so um, the Gospel of John is an amazing book, and so I'm excited to take this journey with you. Um, I want you to see this picture behind me. If I can get Denise to show it on the screen. Does anyone recognize this picture? It's the Mona Lisa, right? And I don't know about you, but I don't know what's so irresistible about the Mona Lisa. I mean, every day, thousands of people cram into this stark beige room in Paris in the Louvre Museum to view Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. I don't know how something so seemingly ordinary can be irresistible to so many people. Maybe it's the mystery of her identity. Who is the Mona Lisa? Who is this woman that captivated so many imaginations? Perhaps it's the genius of the artist. Perhaps it's Leonardo da Vinci that, you know, just because of what he is and who he is, maybe there's just something special behind the scenes in Mona Lisa's life and the painting. Perhaps it's just the depth of the meaning hidden behind an ordinary life that she seems ordinary, but there's something mysterious and profound and, and beautiful behind the Mona Lisa. I like what 16th century art historian Giorgio Vasari <coughs> said. In this work of Leonardo, there was a smile so pleasing that it was a thing more divine than human to behold. It was not other than alive. The smile, something so captivating to behold, something seemingly so divine behind that ordinary picture of the Mona Lisa. And what I would put out before you this morning is that the Gospel of John is the Mona Lisa of the Gospels. The Gospel of John is the Mona Lisa of the Gospels, called the fourth Gospel. It is unique, and it stands alone from the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew emphasizes the kingship of Christ. Mark, his servanthood. Luke, his manhood, and in the Gospel of John, we see the Godhood of Jesus Christ. And it is unique. It is separate. There are similarities, but there are stark differences in the Gospel of John. You see, in the first century, these four apostolic accounts were bundled together um, almost as in a book, not as the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Matthew or even the Gospel of Luke, but, but it was seen as the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Matthew and according to Luke and according to Mark and according to John. And the author, though debated by skeptical and modern critical scholars, is held to be the Apostle John throughout church history and is affirmed by early church fathers such as Irenaeus. But John tells us the purpose of his writing this gospel, this good news account of Jesus of Nazareth in the fourth gospel in John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. So we're actually going to go to the end of John to see what the whole thing is about. So on the screen behind me, we're going to read these words. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that... You may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. 
So the whole purpose of the Gospel of John is to introduce you to someone. It's to introduce you to Jesus of Nazareth, who John makes the bold claim that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, God in the flesh, and that by believing in this Jesus, you could experience life. As Jesus would say later in the Gospel of John, life to the full. Believing in his name, you would experience life to the full. John would, was the son of Zebedee. If you watch The Chosen, he's Big John. He was one of the twelve and one of the three in Jesus' inner circle. The writer of John, or the author of in the book of John, the, the writer or the author is never explicitly implicated. However, what we see that John himself, or the, the writer of the book of John, discloses himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, we see later in the book. And in John chapter 21, it's the epilogue. There's a structure in the Gospel of John. The first 18 verses are the prologue. Then there's two books, the book of signs, and then there's the book of glory. And then you have at the very end, at the last chapter, chapter 21, you have the epilogue. And in the epilogue, it says in verse 24, if I can get that on the screen. Let me turn there myself. I can't read it on the screen out in the back. But in John chapter 21, this is what it says. At the very end of the epilogue, this is how it is described in verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written, I suppose, but the world itself could not contain the book's that would be written. In other words, John is crafting. It's sheer genius. He's crafting a portrait. It is a masterpiece. It is a Rembrandt. And like with all classical, beautiful, amazing works of art, it requires to stare at it. That's why when you go to art galleries, there's little benches that you can sit and you can just stare and contemplate. And it's why many just stare at the Mona Lisa looking at the little curl of her lips and, and, and wondering about the little different details. And, and it, the, the Gospel of John is like that. It requires attention. It, it's so simple that a small child could read it or a new believer could read it. But it's so deep and it's so profound that years and years years, a lifetime, an eternity is not enough to plumb the depths of the beauty and the truth and the life in the gospel of John. It really is a work of art. You see, this is the, 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 the author of John, is the disciple who ran with Peter to discover the empty tomb, as we will read in the last couple chapters. This is the disciple who sat next to Jesus at the Last Supper. This book that we are going to study and unpack over the next several months is an eyewitness account of John, one of Jesus's closest friends on the earth during his incarnation. In other words, John sat down with Mona Lisa. He knew who Mona Lisa was, and if Jesus is the, the subject of this amazing work of art and literature that we call the Gospel of John, John knew him, sat with him, ate with him, drank with him, served with him, discovered the empty tomb with Peter. This is an eyewitness account. It is an apostolic record. An apostle is a sent one. It, it's one who had eyewitness, first-hand knowledge of the risen Lord. That's what an apostle is. But more than that, he was a dear friend of Jesus of Nazareth. He was the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is the author of the Gospel of John. And later in his epistle, 1 John, he has three epistles. The uh, Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John, the three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. But in 1st John, writing to a community of believers, this is how John describes his experience with this Jesus of Nazareth. It'll be on the screen behind me. But in 1st John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, this is what John says. That which was from the beginning... 
which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest or shown to us, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. Why? So that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John was most likely written to unbelievers, whether it was Jews or Gentiles who knew well the Torah and had heard of the the, the Jewish God of Yahweh. But 1 John was written to believers. But we see the same testimony from the Apostle John, that they heard Jesus, they saw Jesus, they touched Jesus, and with the apostolic band, they declared the truth that Jesus was the Messiah. Messiah. Did you catch that again? We have heard. We have seen. We have looked upon. We have touched with our hands. That's amazing. This is the author of the Gospel of John. So the Gospel of John has apostolic authority because it is a first-hand account of the life of Jesus. And that makes it all the more spectacular the claims that are going to be made by John. And we'll discover one of those this morning. But, but when we understand what John is actually saying about Jesus, our minds will be blown because he is making claims after seeing it with his own eyes and hearing Jesus talk and touching Jesus himself, the resurrected Christ. So as we unpack the Gospel of John, we are going to hear some breath taking claims about Jesus, really unbelievable claims. We are going to see his glory in the text. We are going to witness his signs by rereading and hearing them. We are going to smell the aroma of the bread of life, and our parched souls are going to thirst for the living water. You see, in the Gospel of John, we are going to witness the irresistible life of Jesus. And trust me, friends, it is irresistible. If the claims are to believe that John makes in this book, it is life-changing. It is transformative. You see, because John wrote this gospel, this good news, to introduce you to the Mona Lisa, you could say. Yes, the 21 chapters, they are breathtaking. They are breathtaking when you understand them. So they must be stared at looked at, examined, contemplated. A child can read, yet they are deep enough that it will take eternity to mine the depths of the beauty and the glory in this book. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing to sit down and talk with Mona Lisa, to understand her story, to understand why she's smiling? Wouldn't it be amazing to talk with Leonardo da Vinci, to understand why he did the paint strokes and the shadowing and the contours. Wouldn't it be amazing? And yet what we hear from the Gospel of John is that we get to hear firsthand eyewitness account of someone who did actually talk with Jesus. And the amazing truth that John will unpack as we read through the scriptures together is that because of the Spirit of the living God, because of the Holy Spirit, which he will call the paraclete, the comforter and the advocate, we can actually experience firsthand through faith in our hearts the actual beauty of Jesus by the Spirit. It's not just something for John. It's not just something for the disciples or who those who saw him in their firsthand account, the resurrected body. Because of the Holy Spirit, we can actually taste and see that the Lord is good. And one day, because of his life, death, and resurrection, we can actually, in the new heavens and the new earth, we can sit down with Jesus and we can eat and we can drink and we can talk to John and the apostles. But in the meantime, we have the Holy Spirit who will will enlighten our minds and open the eyes of our hearts so that we can see who Jesus is. This gospel really is a work of art. There's so many different levels of meaning. Read it once, you may be changed. Read it ten times. Read it twice. Read it a hundred times. And you will never reach the bottom. You will continue to see new things and new levels of meaning. You see, like the Mona Lisa, something seemingly so ordinary has captivated the hearts of thousands, millions, because the mystery of her enigmatic smile. 
And so as we take the next several months to examine this Mona Lisa of the Gospels, my prayer for you, for me, is that we are captivated by his beauty, captivated by his majesty, captivated by the glory of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And my prayer is that you are mesmerized by the irresistibility of Christ because here it is, he is irresistible. So this morning, if you're not a Christian, if you're seeking or you're curious, um, I pray that you will come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh, and that by believing in him, you may experience life in his name. If you're a nominal Christian, and what that means is that you are a Christian in name only, but you haven't yet experienced the deep, profound beauty of Christ that changes your life, then I pray that you will encounter the living Christ and that you will taste and see that he is good and your life will be changed. And this morning, if you're a disciple of Christ, then I pray that you will fall in love with Christ more and more and that the depths of his beauty and the depths of his grace and his love, that you would drink deep from the fountain of living water so that in your everyday life, you would make Jesus irresistible as the same living waters by the Holy Spirit flow from your belly. This is my prayer for us, Vintage Church, and this is my prayer for you. So would you join me this morning as we pray? Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the gift that is the gospel of John. And I pray that we would mark in our hearts and we would mark in our calendars even this exploration of this book that like those who would go and see the Mona Lisa and sit and stare and contemplate and think and question, Father, and look deep behind those eyes with that smile, I pray that we as your church or those even who are seeking and curious, that we would stare at Jesus as presented by John. And we would see just how irresistible he is. And so I pray that you would give us this morning a spirit of wisdom and revelation. That we would have eyes to see who he is so that we might know Jesus better. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the Gospel of John chapter 1. So please stand for the reading of God's Word. We stand um, at Vintage Church as we read God's Word to honor the Word of God. It is living and active. It is the very words of God, breathed out by His Spirit, given to human geniuses or ordinary men like the Apostle John to write about and reveal God to us. This is what it says in verse 1. We'll be reading to verse 5 this morning. This is our text. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is the word of the Lord, and you may be seated. Imagine that you're a first century Jew, or a Gentile that is familiar with the God of the Hebrews. You've, you've read the Torah, and maybe you're even familiar with Greek philosophers like Plato, or Socrates, or Aristotle. You've spent many days reading the book of beginnings or Genesis, and immediately, immediately when you hear three words, in the beginning, alarms go off. You lean in, you start to engage because something is afoot. You see, these three words changed everything for the hearer. They're brought back to the very first words of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. And, you know, three words can have a lot of power. I remember the first time I heard three words, I love you, from my then-girlfriend. Changed a lot 
to know that someone actually loved me. Just three words, a lot can change. And I'm telling you right now, when we understand what John is doing here in this first five verses, those three words in the beginning opens up a whole world of possibilities. Because what John is about to claim is that this Jesus is the same one who we find in Genesis chapter 1. And you're like, well, how does it say anything about Jesus? It just talks about this thing called the Word. Well, as we will see in a little bit, spoiler alert, verse 14, it says that the Word became flesh. And as we begin to unpack what this means, it's truly breathtaking. It is astounding. It's mind-blowing. You see, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. And what's going to happen in these next 14 words in the English language is such an economy of words. It's such profound doctrine. It's such profound truths that John blows us all away within the first few lines. It's absolutely astonishing because right here we see the foundation for the doctrine of the Trinity. And we also see the deity of Christ here established in these first couple verses. Now, as I already pointed out, to be fair, Jesus of Nazareth, the one that we celebrate around Christmas time, the one born in Bethlehem, born in a manger, born to Joseph, and born to Mary, um, we don't hear anything about him until verse 14 in the prologue, but John is making the case. He's making the case that this Jesus of Nazareth, the one that we all know who was a historical figure, the one who lived in space and time, that this Jesus Jesus is the Word, is the Word made mention of in verse 1 and 2 of John's first gospel in the prologue. prologue. Excuse me. So we're going to immediately have to be go all the way back to Genesis 1. So let's read that piece so we can have some context of what John is trying to describe about this reality of the existence of the Word. So um, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, this is what it says. In the beginning, God. So see the parallels here. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, God. He's saying the same thing. He's saying that the Word was God. And he actually says that right there in verse 1, that the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. But it goes, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness, chaos. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. You see, at the beginning of creation... Before anything, before there was a universe, before there were suns and solar systems and galaxies, before anything, there was God, the uncreated creator. There was God. And then one time he spoke and he pushed back the darkness. He ordered the chaos and he began to create what we would call our known universe. And what John is claiming is that this word, and in the Greek it's this idea of the word logos, and, and, and Aristotle and um, Plato actually understood in classical Greek philosophy, this is an actual term for the reason and intelligibility, and they had a, a concept in Greek philosophy about um, the, the one, uh, the source of all things that was omnipotent and perfect and pure and holy, and that it was so pure and so holy that it needed something to mediate its existence to the world, and and that was the basis of all logic and rationality and why we have math and science and art. And it's interesting that that John uses that word because he's reaching not only to Greek philosophy, but really the context of this really is about the Hebrew Bible because this idea of the Word of God is all over the, 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 the Old Testament right there on the first pages of Genesis. In the beginning was God, and God created how? By his word, let there be light. And can you imagine that moment? It was just chaos and darkness, and all that there was was God. There was no space. There was no time. It was just God living together in Trinity. Perfect unity. Father, Son, and Spirit. And even in this first 
couple words when it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The Greek connotation there is that, that this with is toward God, meaning there's some type of reality within the very nature and being of God that there's the son or this word was, was toward, intimate, facing toward God himself. And, and it was with God, but it was dis- and distinct from God, but it was indistinguishable from God. You're like, that's a lot. It is. It's mind-boggling. And yet, here it is, right on the first verse, with God, and the word was God. Which means, and and look at verse 2, it says, he was in the beginning with God. Meaning, this word, this logos, was in the beginning before God spoke spoke and light flung across the universe and stars were flung into their existence and God began to create the natural order and begin to order the sun and the moon and the light cycles and the rain cycles and, and everything about that we find marvelous and amazing about all creation. The word was with God in the beginning and the word was God. And that's what's going to make it all the more mind-blowing when in verse 14 we read that this word, this Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. And John actually touched this word. He touched God in the flesh. He touched the word, became flesh, because he tabernacled and dwelt with man. He saw him. He heard him. He heard the same voice that said, let there be light. John heard him talk at the Last Supper. Like, like the, the claims here are just absolutely phenomenal and amazing. He was in the beginning with God. So, so this word, who was God and was with God, before God said, let there be light, he's there. He's uncreated. There's no created, there's never a time where the word was not in existence. There was no point, unlike what the Jehovah's Witnesses and others would believe, that this Jesus of Nazareth was created by God. no. Jesus Christ has always been. He is the Son of God. He is the Word of God. He is God, and yet He is with God. This is the foundational beginnings of the idea of the Trinity right here in the Gospel of John. And look at verse 3. All things were made through Him. And without him, the word, the logos, without him was not anything made that was made, which means there is nothing in all creation that does not find its source from the word. It does not find its source from, we will understand Jesus. Jesus is the fountain of all things. He is the source of all life. So much so does this form early church doctrine that the Apostle Paul and the writer of Hebrews would say this in Colossians 1, 15 to 17. This is what Paul says to the church in Colossae. He is, Jesus, speaking about Jesus, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That means he is the highest in rank. He's the authority over all creation. For by him... All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together, meaning the molecules and the cells and the atoms in your body are being held together right now because of Jesus. If he decided to go... You would be like, please help me breathe. Like, it's all held together by Jesus right now. Everything in existence is being held together by the Word. This Logos, the Son of God, it's all being held together. Whether angels, authorities, both things that we see visibly or invisibly. So all of the structures of angels and everything in the spiritual realm, everything was created by God through the Word, by the Spirit. Everything. You see, for some of you, 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 you think Satan is somehow um, equal with Jesus or God and not even in the light littlest bit. 
God made the devil. He made the angels. All things are made or created through Christ. He is sovereign over all things. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, it says this, Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In other words, in the Old Testament, God spoke through prophets, and he spoke through different ways. He even speaks through creation. But God spoke finality in the Word, capital W, Jesus Christ. He is God in the flesh. The final and full revelation of who God is, is born in Bethlehem, is the Word of God made flesh. It is God's fullest and final revelation of himself. Isn't it amazing that John is going to make this claim that this Jesus of Nazareth, a historical figure, that born in Bethlehem, in space and time and history, he is the uncreated creator. He is God. He's the God of Genesis 1. He is the I am of Moses. He is Yahweh. He is the word of God. He is the tabernacle presence that descended upon the tabernacle in Exodus. He is the angel of the Lord that went before the people. This is Jesus. And look at verse 4 with me. In him, in the word, who we know as Jesus, was life. All of life. Anything that you think is beautiful. Anything, when you see a sunset and you're just stunned at the beauty of it. When you see life, when, when a baby is born, everything that we know as life, good, pleasing, joy, anything like that finds its source from God. He is life itself. And when God decided to create for the showing of his glory so that we might share in his joy, at an overflow of the goodness that he was, he decided to create the universe for his glory and for our joy so that we could share. And we're going to get there at the end in, uh, I think it's John 17, where this whole chapter talks about we get to share in the life and in the fellowship of God and in the Trinity, and we get to share in the dance that is called the Trinity. This is mind-blowing, what John is beginning to set up here, and that we're going to take a whole lot of months to unpack together. But it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. In other words, there is no light outside of Christ. You cannot experience true life unless you are seeing through the filter and the lens and the light of Christ. Light has this idea of revelation. And you will not know life to the full until you experience the life of Christ. You can taste it. In part, you can have glimpses of it because of common grace. But here is the big idea this morning. that there is no way that you can experience true life outside of Christ. Because he is life. He is the source of life. He is the fountain of life. And what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 2 is that all of us have turned away from the fountain of living waters and we have dug out our own cisterns or our own wall, wells that cannot hold water. In other words, we are looking for something to give us life. We're, we're looking for something eternal that can give us life and satisfaction and joy and happiness. And we look in sex and in power and in money or in video games or entertainment or TikTok or whatever it is. And we think that that will give us life. And we find that it is broken and hollow and can't cannot give us water. And what God is telling us is that this Jesus, this word, is the very source of light. That the word is life itself. Everything that we imagine as life finds its origin, its source in the Logos, in the word. And here it is. We know who this is. John touched him, heard from him, saw him. John knew him. And John, who was a Jew himself, is telling us, writing it in such a beautiful way, saying, please hear me. 
The whole reason I'm writing this is that you would believe that Jesus of Nazareth is in fact the Son of God. He is in fact God in the flesh. He is the Logos. Please believe this so that you can experience life if you would believe in his name. And we're going to unpack this, but you can experience the, the, the rights to be a called a child of God, that you can be born again, that you can have life to the full, that the Spirit of God, that you can have a, a, a part in the very fellowship of the Trinity itself. This is the, the claims that John is going to make all throughout the book of John. This is the same word that ordered chaos and pushed back darkness in Genesis 1. And it's the same God who can push back chaos and order chaos and push back darkness in our own lives and in our own hearts. Because the truth of the gospel is this, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. The truth of the gospel is this, that we all have darkness in our hearts but outside of Christ. And, and the, the, what John is trying to get at is that the same God who said, let there be light in Genesis 1 is the same God in the flesh who can say, let there be light in our dark hearts. We won't, I don't have it on the screen behind me, but I want you to see what Paul, as an apostle, picks up about this theme of the light of God pushing back darkness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 3, it says this. Just listen, if you don't have the time to turn there. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Did you catch that? What is the problem of your unbelieving friends? And this morning, if you don't believe in Christ, if you never tasted or seen, the problem isn't that you're not good enough. The problem isn't that you've sinned too much. The problem is that you have not yet seen that Jesus is irresistible. The problem is that you have not yet seen that he is God, that he is the source of all light and all life and all love. That's the problem. You haven't seen it yet. And so my prayer for you and the prayer for all of us is that we would have a spirit of revelation this morning so that we would know who Christ is. Because when we see him, we see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Look at verse 5. He says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Look at this, verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. That's a Genesis 1 moment has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, we have this treasure in jars of clay. In other words, if you're a Christian this morning, it's because God made a new creation out of you by shining light in the darkness. And here's the beautiful truth that we find in John chapter 1, verse 5. The darkness can't do anything about it. Amen. <laughs> Let's go back to John chapter 1 and look at what he says in verse 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. But look at verse 5. The light shines. Not shined. Shines. It's in the present tense. It's continual. It's shining. Even today. John is writing this from the perspective of seeing his friend, his rabbi, died, crucified, going to the empty tomb, seeing that he was risen from the dead, touching and tasting and e eating meals with him as a resurrected Savior, seeing him ascend and then preaching boldly by the power of the Holy Spirit that this Jesus that we knew as our rabbi was the Word of God made flesh. This rabbi is Jesus the creator of all things. And he's saying that this light shines in the darkness. Just like the, the darkness could do nothing when God decided to create in Genesis 1, and he started to say, I'm going to create today. Whatever time that was, he had to create space and time to create in that day. But in, anyways, he said, I'm going to create. Boom! He creates space, time, and the universe start flinging into existence. The darkness could do nothing. The chaos could do nothing because God decided to act and to create through his word and by his spirit. It. And in the same way, your dark heart, your rebellious heart, your sinful heart, your, your life full of pain and, and, and heartache and whatever it may be has no shot. The darkness cannot 
overtake or comprehend the light and love and life of Christ. It automatically, God gives us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Meaning, when you see Jesus for who he is, that he is the irresistible Christ, you will be changed forever. You will see him as he is, the very fountain of life, because the word of God, the word is life cannot grasp it. Darkness cannot comprehend it. And my friends, I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what's going on in your heart. I hope that, that you have seen Jesus in your own heart and, and that your heart is, is beating this morning with passion because you're like, that's my Savior. That's my Lord. He is the, the fountain of life. He is the fountain of living waters. John's going to call him the bread of life. He's going to call him living waters. He's going to call him the light of the world. He's going to call him all these things in the gospel of John. And you're like, that's my Jesus. And I want everybody to know about Jesus. So I'm going to go tell everybody about this Jesus because he is the word of God made flesh. And then there's some of you that are like, I've been in church my whole life, but I don't, uh, why is this guy talking so loud and excitedly? Because the Jesus that we worship is life itself, is light itself, is love itself. It shines, <clears throat> not to John only, but it shines today by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the darkness can do nothing. This is why Jesus can say, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Because darkness, death, or the demonic have no power over Jesus. None. Your sin, your past, your guilt, your shame, your fear has nothing on Jesus. He literally created everything out of nothing. Do you not think that he can change your life? Do you not think that he can transform your existence and, and so that you can taste and see that he is good and then set you on a path to be used for his glory and for your joy? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and this is why we are spending so much time this year in this gospel. Because I believe with all my heart that it has the power to ignite us, not because of anything, but because of his word and because of his spirit. Because if you caught that in Genesis chapter 1, how did God create everything? Through his word and through his spirit. How did God create? In the Valley of Dry Bones, we sang a song that talked about our bones singing. You're like, what does that even mean? How do my bones sing? Um, it's an it's a, it's a allusion to Ezekiel 37 where there's a valley of dry bones. And Ezekiel, who's a prophet, asks this question, can these dry bones live? And he says, yes, they can live, but they can live only by one thing. The Word of God, two things. The Word of God and the Spirit of God. So he says, prophesy my word. And he says, breathe on them. It's the same two agents that we see at creation, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Because um, in Psalm chapter 30, if I can find it real quick. Can you just, Psalm, I think it's 33. Do I have that on there? No. Nope. Um, but in in the Psalms, it says that by the word of the Lord, the heavens were created. By his breath, the stars were known. Something like that. Did you catch that again? The word of the Lord and the breath. And the, the word for breath in the Hebrew, ruach, is the same word for spirit. This is how God always creates his word and his spirit. And so how? How are we created in Christ Jesus? How are we made alive in him? The word and the Spirit. This is the beauty of the gospel. When the gospel is proclaimed, when the word of Christ is preached and the Spirit regenerates and makes alive hearts, lives change. New creation happens. The, the, the sin can't do anything about it. Your shame, your guilt, your past can't do anything about it. When the word of God speaks and the Spirit of God moves and it hovers over your darkness, chaos will be ordered and your life will be transformed and you will never be the same because you will have tasted from living waters the very fountain of life. Life, Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the Logos. This is the Gospel of John. 
And he just comes out shooting in the first five verses. And I can't wait to keep exploring this with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. You are the word. You are the locus. You are the, the fountain of living water. You are the very source and fountainhead of life. So I cannot wait to keep digging and diving in to the life of Christ in the gospel of John because it's irresistible. And I just want to pray for you this morning if, if you're not a Christian, but something through the word of God being proclaimed and through the spirit of God at work, there's something in your heart that's saying, that's him. That's, that's, that's the source of life. That, that's, he's everything. He's the creator. He's, his name is Jesus. And, and you would put your faith in him and, and you would believe in his name, that he is the Christ, the king of all kings, that, that he is God in the flesh and that you would believe in his name and that you would be granted life this morning by his spirit and through his word. If that's you, I want to pray for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if something's just coming alive in your chest this morning and you're like, I, I believe in Jesus. He is who he said he is. He is who John said he is. Would you just lift up your hand so I can pray for you? I'm not going to ask you to do anything crazy. I just want to pray for you. Is there anyone in here? Anyone? A couple? All right. Father, I thank you for those that would lift their hands and just say, I see you, Jesus, for who you are. I want my life to bend around you. You're glorious. Help me, Jesus. I put my faith in you this morning. And then for, for some of you this morning, you're just a nominal Christian. And what that means is you go to church, you might even read the Bible or go to Bible studies, but really you're a Christian by name only. And you've lost the awe and you've lost the wonder of what it means to be a Christian, to be a worshiper of Jesus, the Word of God. But this morning, you're just going to say, I, I need revival in my soul. I need to see Jesus afresh and anew. I want that spirit of wisdom and revelation that Paul talks about so that I can know Jesus better. And if that's you this morning, would you just lift up your hands so that I can pray for you? Father, I pray for these that would say, I want to know Jesus. Not the boring Jesus, not the religious Jesus, but the Jesus that is full of life. The author of life, life itself. And you would put a burning zeal in their hearts. Now, one more prayer request. If you're a disciple of Christ, you could say with John, you're a disciple whom Jesus loves. You would say, I have this living water, and I know that others need it. And you would commit today to pray for your unbelieving friends and family, and you would commit today to invite them to hear about the Gospel of John, whether it's from me on Sundays or from your own mouth, sharing with them what you are learning and sharing with them about the Gospel, that you will commit to pray for your unbelieving friends and family, and that the same purpose that John wrote the book for, that they would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and have life in his name. That would be your commitment. And if that's you this morning, I just want you to stand. Jesus, I thank you for these disciples, these sons and daughters that you love. If Jesus... If you are who you say you are, if you are who John says you are, then wow, what a treasure in jars of clay that we have. And we want others who have been blinded by the God of this age, we want them to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ by the light of the gospel. And we get to be in the gospel for a long time. So, Lord, continue to shine your light in and through us. May it be reflected off of our lives. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Why don't you stay standing and everyone else can stand as we now prepare to take communion.